on the international side of biobalances. Uh, we talked about that yesterday, you can go ahead. Uh, we have also the journal. Uh, now the third issue is going to get out. This is just a few information about what we are going to do and what we are doing in this area of Italy. We work in Atena uh, in the city of Segni. We just had um, a work together with Julia Creativa and other friends. Uh, and the Progetto Lepus is about the Comunità Montana dei Monti Levino. This is a community of five cities. So everything has started in Atena. We started enhancing uh, life quality here by just asking people what they want. And I really liked that uh, Marco has gone around asking people what they need. He found some young couples and they said, oh, we, we really enjoy to stay here, but with these no services. For example, we would like to have a pool. Uh, and he, he, he thought of this small house that <coughs> collapsed can be transformed in a small pool for children. It would be fantastic to have a thing like that in Senior. So things like that, just small things that can be uh, form a kind of system. Uh, if you have only uh, one idea, uh, it can start, blow and die. But if you have several ideas, you get a kind of humus. They help themselves and you get a complex system growing up and self-organizing itself. So we started with Project Artena, then the mayor, Seni, called us and asked, OK, I want to do the same thing with my city. Um, so we started with uh, this laboratory that has been directed by Julia. And now we are going on uh, trying to trigger some process, some self-evolution uh, of the city uh, in Seni. And then the mayor of the other five, the other three cities that are together with the two cities of Artena and Seni, asked, OK, we want it too. So uh, you know, everybody is going crazy for biomedical design. Uh, this is just a few examples of what we did. Uh, um, the Project Artena started with a presentation and then we started making you know, things like that. This is a kind of advertise about the city. It's small poetry saying what the city is because nobody knows it. Um, then we make some packaging for the cheese. The local cheese is delicious actually, but they sell at the half price of the, the, the one you can buy in Rome, for example. And they sell just locally, so they need a kind of image. So our designs make something like that. This is a mule, and the, we have a slogan. This, we are more stubborn than a mule, um, and people like it. So people come, and they, 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 they bought the, the cheese, and they brought home this kind of advertising. And they become curious about the city, so they started visiting the city, etc. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, uh, this is the map of Artena that you know. Uh, I prize it so much because I really liked it. Um, and this is also a kind of advertising city. It's very helpful to move inside the city for tourists coming, the first tourists coming, because we made a kind of development of this small hotel, uh, teaching them how to work with the revenue management and uh, how to enter the market, etc. And so we discovered that there is a, a natural market that is interested in uh, getting to Artena. Especially people from Northern Europe are getting here and staying even one week because then they can visit all the cities around, small centers. Uh, because you know, Athena is so much close to Rome and this can become a kind of disadvantage because people say, okay, I go to Rome, of course, I go to visit that. But there are a lot of people that want to see a kind of real Italy. So and around Athena you got small gems like it. And it's very nice to stay here, enjoy, it's cheap, but you can have good food, nice people, and you visit all this stuff that nobody usually knows. Uh, so we found that there is this kind of tourism, and they come, they stay long, even longer than in Rome. So it's a good business. But they, they were getting lost, asking the mules for directions, and <laughs> so we provided them. But also, we are going to print it in 30,000 exemplars to just spread the world. It's, it's so beautiful that people get uh, you know, curious about the city. Go ahead. Okay, these are friends. Uh, you can recognize Angelo Gentili to the right, and girls, 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 of course. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Okay, other products we worked with the beer, we presented that to the public, and so on. Uh, this, is a, uh, oh, this is a photo context that we made. It's uh, glimpses of Artena. So if you want to take pictures of the city during the time, it's for free. You can apply to that. You just go to the website as soon as we have internet. Uh, <laughs> even when you return, it will be finished in August. So you can send your pictures, and if you are very clever, you will win 500 euros. Mm. Go ahead, please. Oh, no, that's very nice. That's so cute. Somebody asked us, okay, well, maybe I can make some, uh, you know, uh, comics about uh, the mules and uh, the bandits. And so we have now this kind of story that's very nice. So we got a mule 
who doesn't speak, but actually he knows eight languages. And he knows a lot about philosophy and uh, bio urbanism and whatever. And, <laughs> many, and they are very friendly to each other. Okay, go ahead, please. Uh, this is our school of uh, home brewing. 55 students coming here, and they paid for that, and with this money we could go ahead with our projects. Well, please. Uh, this is our website, Project Tortena, showing the beauty of, of the area for the first time. Right. Uh, this is another website we are going to do. Of course, this is New York, it's not <laughs> Athena. Uh, but it was meant just as a project to uh, give the possibility of uh, local people to get in touch with the entire world, and especially to make a kind of market so that they can sell the local products uh, through the internet, in the sense that people can come here for the first time, they like, for example, the cheese, and when, so they buy cheese, and they bring them home, but when they, they finish the cheese, and the story is gone. But in that case, they have some connection, so they can get to the internet and buy the cheese as well. Uh, the Projecto Lemos is about these five cities, as you can see, they are all beautiful, very interesting. The last one is Senyi, where we have been the last week. Go ahead, please. So we got also urban projects. Uh, we make dissemination uh, lectures and summer school like this. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead. This is a project we were holding in Rome again. Okay, go home. Go ahead. This is a book that we published. Go ahead, please. Summer school. Go ahead. Okay. And this is my code. This is the sandboard, actually. I told you. You can go ahead. Go ahead, please. Again. And this is my code. You know you. How beautiful it is. Okay, that <coughs> is by uh, we, uh, we made a short introduction yesterday. Uh, so, the term by Uber has been uh, invented in a way. Uh, it's, nothing is new under the sun, but it was just uh, applying the term by bio, it means life, uh, to the concept of urbanization. And there are four of us that work on this stuff and try to make a kind of definition. Of course, uh, ideas are always in the air. You have just to grasp them and put in the f and give them a form, give them a shape. Um, you can find a definition of it if you like on the internet. But the point is that biotechnology is about considering the city as a whole complex system, a living system. This means it's a hyper complex system. What does it mean? Hyper complex. Hyper complex means that you get a kind of four dimension. So you can have a, a complex system that is physical, but you get an, an emergent problem. This emergent property is like a four dimension. Antonio talked about what does it mean, a complex system. You can consider there is a, a super level that emerges from this complexity that adds something. I would say that is intentionality. So people's intentionality and objects' intentionality. When you build something like a table, it's not, not only stuff. This has also a kind of direction. This means something. This is a, this is a, an a so this means that it has an intentionality. Intentionality is, in a, in a way, the design itself that is here. So when the designer of this table had something in mind, he thought, OK, I can sit down, have some stuff to put in. I want to be the same. I, oh, I'm, 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 I'm a short man. This is quite good for me, not for Pavel. So intentionality, I mean, it's not so universal. In a way. Right, please. Um, we refer. Uh, to four main uh, frames and, uh, when we think to the city as a living organism. The first one is the laws of form and self-organization and evolution. We are going to talk to, about that because it's quite complicated in a way. Epigenetics, uh, that means the, the, the second part of, of genetics. Uh, we have been taught in school and university that we have information coming from the genes, this is biology, and going to the cell. So all the information is in the gene, and it cannot be reversed. For example, if uh, someone has cancer, the, this old school say, OK, there is something wrong in the gene. Maybe because the gene has been, I don't know, touched by some chemicals. Or, but usually they say there is a defect, a natural defect in the gene. So the information is wrong, and you get cancer. Uh, epigenetics say no, this is not exactly like that. Uh, they started to know that like 20 years ago, also because, you know, as soon as we have more technology, we can enter more deep in things, and we discover more. And especially when a scientist talk about chance, or talk about uh, rubbish, or whatever, uh, don't take it seriously, because this is just covering the ignorance. Um, in science, uh, ignorance is because we don't have enough technology to see some things. Uh, so let's say until 
five, six years ago, yes, maybe five, six, there was still somebody, some biologists talking about junk information in the genes. Uh, this is very arrogant, actually. They, they, they found, okay, we have the genes, there's a lot of information there. Uh, we know that this part of information is being used in like 5%, and the other must be junk. It's just, you know, rubbish. Uh, it's been done just by mistake. Now we are discovering, step by step, in the last years, that all this junk information is very rich treasure information. And you can consider the gene like a disk, and the cell, or the organ, or the organism, can decide which part of the disk has to be read, which part of the disk has to be activated. So you get a kind of feedback from the organism, from the organ, and from the cell, on the information of the gene. And even, you can have a change in the gene information. So you can, you can have a kind of reversal. You get information that comes from the environment, that get to the body, and get to the genes, in a way. In the sense that you can even have some genes that is transferred horizontally from one gene to another one. Uh, this is the genetic transfer that's been discovered during the 70s, so it's not nothing new, but it took so much time to enter the mainstream ideology. Because you got the ideology everywhere. You got in architecture, you got in philosophy, you got in science. Then systems biology. System biology is about that. It's considering uh, the organism not but like machines, but, but as complex systems that are integrated in a more general system, that is the ecological system. And then the constructal law, and uh, it deserves some attention because it, it's something very interesting that uh, link the biological world to the uh, physical world. This is very important. No. No, now we're going to talk about that. As I told you, for example, Patrick Geddes was one of the fathers of uh, urbanism saying that, okay, we have to consider the city as an organism. But the point is, uh, what, what, what an organism is for Patrick Geddes? Actually, the biology of his time was about considering the cities as organism, even if he was saying exactly the contrary. He was saying, the city is not a machine, the city is an organism. But the concept of organism he had was very similar to that of a, of a, of a mechanism. Go ahead, please. Uh, in the last 20 years, as I told you, everything has been changed. Uh, so, for example, by the observation of swarms, or by observation of how birds move all together, we ethologists understood that there was something missing. Uh, it was impossible that you get a kind of super mind providing the flock of birds to move all together at the same time. How do they do that? Uh, are they so intelligent that they can organize themselves in such a beautiful thing? You know, we got the eye-plane gunners who fly together, sometimes they crash, of course. But it never happens with birds. And, I mean, they, they don't have a kind of training for that. They just start doing that. And uh, Antonio talked about that already. Here we have four fathers of this revolution in biology. Uh, the first one is Russian, Nikolai Vavilov. He made a lot, a lot of studies about uh, plants. And he was like, uh, hey guys, there is something strange with uh, what is happening in nature. There is a kind of order. Um, we have been taught that everything comes out by chance and selection. But I see that there is a kind of uh, you know, periodicity in life. And especially, he, will dealing, he was dealing with wealth and saying, okay, I should have some term in Latin is graminacea, it's a kind of plant that you can find, and you can put, put some like 26 or 30, I don't remember, uh, plants like that, and there were some places missing, and say, oh, in this place, I should find something like that, and he was going around, and he found a lot of them. The other one is Antonio Lima de Faria. Uh, he's Portuguese, but he, he escaped when he was very young to, to Sweden, and he became the director of the Genetic Institute in Lund, he is the father of cytogenetics one of the most important scholars in this field. And when he was about 70s, he wrote a book that is that one evolution without selection, form and function by auto-evolution. That is a kind of, a, you know, it was like a bomb in, 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 the, in, in the scientific world. He was saying, you know what, I studied uh, genes for all along my life, but I found that genes and evolution, uh, genes are not so important for evolution, they are just kind of catalysts. And um, now we are going to talk about it. Darcy Thompson is a, a Scottish scholar. He made a beautiful work on, uh, a beautiful work called On Growth and Fall. 
It's a book that every designer should, be, should read. It's beautiful and it gives a lot of information about how uh, biological forms are mathematically rooted. And this is fantastic. This shows how shells like these and different kinds of fishes can be reduced to some general forms that you can change as you want. The last one is Italian, is actually one of my masters. Uh, I met also Rino Feria and Giuseppe Sermonti. Giuseppe Sermonti is a genetist. He has been the father of microbiological breeding uh, during the 60s. Uh, so he discovered sex in, uh, um, in, in very small animals, you know, in, uh, in bacteria. And because of that, he could produce a lot of uh, this. He could make the small orgies, you know, and, and, and producing a lot of this material is very helpful for medicine. Um, okay, we can go ahead. Uh, so I have to make a disclaimer, because also because we have Americans here, so it's very important. Uh, everybody has heard about intelligent design, you know? Uh, so we got this kind of vision. There are religious people saying, oh, what are you saying? You're Darwinian. That's not true, because the Bible says God uh, made everything. And of course, the scientists say, oh, I mean, you are just religious and you don't think in scientific terms. Of course, things are being designed by chance and selection. Uh, I want to show you that this old vision, uh, it's about a kind of a common frame. So they are both uh, belonging to the same ideology. Let's go ahead. We are de dealing with another thing. We are talking about laws of form. Uh, for example, this beautiful shape. Uh, it does not be designed by any god, in a direct sense. I mean, I, I don't say that God exists or God doesn't exist. I say that God doesn't fit with this subject. Uh, but there is no selection here. There's just a drop of milk falling and producing this beautiful form. Uh, this form has been shaped by the very nature of constraints, of physical and chemical constraints, how molecules get connected to each other, for example how the pressure of air is constraining the movement of the, of the liquid. Go ahead, please. The first opposition between religious people and scientific people is among two metaphysical problems. What does it mean? Uh, did, did, did you know Thomas Kuhn? Uh, well, OK. Uh, sometimes I forget that they are not students in philosophy. So uh, metaphysical problem, what does it mean? Uh, Whenever a scientist says, you know, no metaphysics, I'm a scientist, just facts, I'm positive. Okay, behind that, there is a metaphysical idea. For example, the metaphysical idea is that metaphysics doesn't exist, that everything is done by matter. Uh, well, how can you say that? How can you say that, for example, there is not a ghost next to me now? You can say that. Um, so they want to show some vision. Uh, and this vision that is behind the positive facts is kind of an interpretation of facts. Uh, can be, you know, saying that there is a ghost, or can say that the ghost doesn't exist because we, we cannot touch it. I don't think there are no ghosts here anyway. The second one is about two different views about, about the reality. Uh, one is an empirical view. It says, okay, drop falls and there are some laws that can explain that kind of shape. This other one says, okay, Stefano has been involved like that and he's bored because it's, it's makes him more fitting to selection. Well, <laughs> let's go ahead. So it's a kind of historical vision. Um, I would say that I, I, I respect both the position in the sense that intelligent design is about you know, I'm religious and I don't want somebody to come with this big clay of science saying that God doesn't exist because Darwin taught it. This is not serious, actually. This is not science. This is just ideology. Go ahead. At the same time, the lucky struggle, as I say, say uh, that life is by chance and necessity. It's a way of protecting science from religious priests coming there. You know, you cannot teach Darwin because, you know, this is not true because it doesn't fit the Bible. It's not science at all. Let's go ahead. So, this is an example. They, they look similar, in a way. I mean, one is a religious one girl, one is a, an artist. Go ahead. Uh, and we have to check that if you think 
there, there is a common root to both of them. For example, Darwin, if you, if, you, if you know the story, he got very interested in the theory of a sociologist of his time, uh, called Malthus. And quite nobody knows that Malthus was a priest. And he was writing this great book about how uh, society evolved, saying that all the bad stuff happening in life is the will of God. So if you got uh, ADS, it's good because God wants it. And this is done because you are a bad guy and uh, we, we need to uh, cancel you from the society so the society become better. Things like that. Well, this is the kind of stuff that Darwin liked and tried to put that in another sense. He say, okay, I cannot talk about God, but I would say that there is a kind of selection. Uh, and this selection works for the better so that all life is going to an evolution, to becoming better, more fitting. So he put chance and selection instead of God. You see, you see the point? So it's, it's not about God or not God, it's about a, a common scheme. No? Go ahead, please. And if you look at the books, you try reading Genesis. You get Genesis is the first book of the Bible, and it's about how the world has been made as by being designed by God. And you got two versions of Genesis, the first one and the second one. Uh, one is more ancient. It has been written about the 5th century before Christ. At that time, uh, you got in the Mediterranean area, more or less, not to you have idea. That was, was the cultured war of the time. At the same time, you got the Greek philosophy. And the Greek philosophers were talking at that time about evolution. They were saying, okay, for example, the philosopher Thales, do you remember? Thales from Greece. Yeah, well, anyway, but we use a thick touch. No? Um, and Thales was saying everything started with water. We just had water, and from the water we got the first small plants and animals, small insects, then they become like fishes, then the fishes started to become kind of walking animals, and at the end, the end we got the humans. So, does it resemble something? And if you go to Genesis, you got God that comes and created the lights, the heart, the physical laws, the, the sea, and the fishes, and the birds, and all the animals, and 